So what I want to discuss in today's talk is the foundation of certain numerical analytical uh, models, mo uh, tools, to um, describe, to approximate solutions of neurobiological networks that are solution to spatially extended models that are non-local. So this is an example from a PhD student of mine, former PhD students at Nottingham, Sammy Petros, and what he's doing here is he's simulating the voltage dynamics um, on a surface uh, whose triangulation has been lifted from uh, imaging data and applying synaptic kernel strengths that are also taken from tractography data. And the type of questions I will be answering today is the following. Can we have a provably accurate scheme that captures solutions of this type? So can we um, assume that as we shrink the, let's say, the triangulation, we are going to get a better solution to this? So for the, for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to discuss dimensions. Uh, I'm going to discuss cortical domains, and in fact, also non-cortical domains that are uh, spatially extended and fully three-dimensional with Jara and Solsai. And the equation that I, the, the, the system that I'm, going to look, that I'm going to be looking at are neural fields equations. And I may hear you, and you may ask at this stage, having seen an enormous sophistication uh, in, in the previous models of this talk, you may ask yourself, why are we now discussing this type of models? Why are we picking these simple equations? And the idea behind that is the following. When a numerical analyst develops models or uh, methods for parabolic equations, the benchmark for those models is a heat equation, a reaction diffusion equation. When uh, they do it for a an elliptic equation, they will be looking at Laplace's equation to develop their models. What is missing in our field is to adopt a description of this type. And what I propose to do is to adopt this as a benchmarking uh, tool, uh, model for developing numerical methods. Why is that? Because it is non-local and it is non-linear. And what I, what I ask you to do is just to stick with me till the end of the talk to see where this is ending up and where it develops further. So to start, with, I want to give uh, two heuristic ways in which we can come up with a numerical uh, method uh, for the neural field equations. So in this case, I will be considering a neural field with no input. You can think of V as being the voltage, W as being your synaptic uh, kernel, and F a firing rate function. And I'm looking at things on a disk just for the time being. So what is one way, but I would argue what is the way we currently think when we want to simulate these type of models? Well, you would say, let me pick a grid of points that are displaced somewhere, distributed somewhere in space in D. And what I want to demand is that this, so this equation be exactly correct at each and every of these points, u of x sub i. And when you do this step, it seems as though you can just about see a set of ODEs appearing. Perhaps you want to call u, x, i, t, u, i, t, and you collect all your unknowns in a vector. And in here, you have u prime that appears in time. And you're not quite there yet, because in here, inside the integral, you have this function of u. So you, you don't quite have a set of ODEs yet. So one way to overcome them, that is to say, well, let me introduce a quadrature rule that is uh, approximating this time the integral over the domain d. And if you do this uh, cleverly enough and your, uh, in, you know, your quadrature nodes are the same as the collocation nodes, you end up with a set of coupled uh, ODEs that you then uh, put on a computer and hope for the best. This is really what is happening in most of my papers, let's say, so far. Yeah? And as, uh, to paraphrase what Patricia says, sometimes I like doing this and sometimes I like proving that thing works. And so I would also say that in some but very limited numbers of paper and literature, what one does, it looks at after the time stepping, so after yet another approximation has been introduced, one looks at uh, what we call a discrete error. So you have your solution at discrete time and discrete space, and you compare it with uh, your approximation. That's work that I would say is mostly being carried out in our community by Lima and Bakar. Let me give you a second way in which you can instead come up heuristically with a with a, um, with a scheme that's called a Galerkin template. Now, my neural field has become just n because the notation is super unwieldy already uh, to start with. <clears throat> and in this case, you don't have a grid, but you have rather a set of modes uh, that, that you choose wisely, let's say, and you decompose the solution in this way, as you would expect. And the game you're playing now is you're trying to come up with a set of ODs for the a sub i. 
let's say. And so what you do, you truncate, uh, you stop at n uh, modes, so to speak, then roughly speaking, you plug this equation inside your neural field, you take in a product because this is what uh, everyone does, let's say, and you arrive at this uh, set of equations, which once again look like ODEs, but they quite it aren't ODEs because you have an integral inside n and now you have an inner product that also is an integral itself. And so what you do, you choose a good quadrature scheme to do the integrals and lo and behold you arrive at a set of ODEs of this type. And once you're there you put it on a computer and so far there is no, not even a discrete error analysis for these type of schemes. Well, that's my claim at least. So you see now two different methods, and I think they have something in common, okay? So they, they start with the following steps. There is a, a vaguely justified approximation in inverted quote for your field U and for the right-hand side of this equation. Both of them have, and they are very separate so far. And they both evoke a quadrature and a time step. So what I need to do in this talk is two things. The first, I need to convince you that if you look at things well enough, these two first steps are the same phase, the two phases of the same thing, okay? That's gonna be really crucial and it's where we're gonna spend most of the talk. The second thing I have to tell you is that the type of analysis that we do so far at the level of error comes only at the end. Namely, when you introduce this approximation, you are speaking about things in function spaces. Then you introduce a quadrature and you have a discrete space. And then you introduce a time step, you have a discrete time, and only then do you do an error estimate. But it turns out that there is a better way to do that. Once you are at the level of function spaces, it is much better, if you can, to perform an error analysis at that level. If you succeed in doing that from a numerical analysis viewpoint, you have some, uh, some winning points, namely the steps that follow they must follow in a way that you control. So, for instance, it is not true that you choose. One, after you do this analysis, it's not true that you choose the quadrature of liberty, but actually it is the error estimates that you do at the level of function spaces that dictates how you have to pick the quadrature. And this is crucial, in fact. This type of uh, approach has been, well, it's actually pervasive in numerical analysis, but for integral equations, has been pioneered by Atkinson. He's not looking at neural field. Atkinson is concerned with Hammerstein equations, so you can think of steady-state uh, versions of the neural fields, and I'm lifting this out to the time-dependent problem. So the starting point for this analysis, now this is where I'm trying to put the two things together, is the work that Olivier and collaborators have done, Olivier Fougerat, I mean, sorry, and collaborators have done uh, on neural fields by interpreting them as Cauchy problems uh, on certain function spaces. So I will not describe until perhaps the very, very end of the talk what hypotheses I make on W, F, and Xi. But it turns out that under generic assumption, in fact, I'm gonna be using this word, under generic assumption, you can define an evolution equation. You can interpret the, the neural field as an evolution equation on a Banach space. What is happening here is that now your uh, U maps at each time T, it returns a an element of a function space, an ambient space that I call X throughout my slides. And uh, once you introduce formally this, uh, you know, this, this notion and you, you of, of course introduce uh, integral operators and pointwise operators that I don't have time to discuss but also will not be important for what I want to tell, once you do that step, you now have an ODE posed on an infinite dimensional dynamic system. What Fogera uh, and collaborators did uh, they studied uh, the set that they showed, they proved that a unique solution exists for this Cauchy problem when x is L2. So when, you have, when you're looking at space of integrable, integrable, square, integrable square integrable functions, and in fact, even spaces, spaces with higher regularity, hm, you can think of. And uh, we have also similar results uh, from Potts and Bain Graben when uh, the, the ambient space is the space of continuous functions. And these Two setups will be important for me. That's the one that I'm going to be using. But I just want to point out that there are a number of other contributors uh, that are partially summarized there that have worked on uh, delayed differential equations as stochastic versions of neural fields. And if I have time, I'm going to get back to them at the end of the talk. So what's, uh, how are you going to approximate this equation? Well, 
the idea is relatively simple. You have an ambient space with your blue trajectory U, and you're now coming up with the, what we call an approximating subspace, X sub N, which I'm here sketching in green. And uh, X sub N is finite dimensional for any N. And your trajectory lives in Xn for all time. And in fact, you don't have just one Xn, you have an, uh, a family of spaces like that. And N, as you increase N, as you, as you increase the integer N, N, your hope is to capture better the solution and possibly better the ambient space. Okay? That's the game we're gonna play. Of course, how you do that is a little bit tricky. So now, remember, I'm trying to put these two things together and I have to tell you what they have in common. And what they have in common can be understood perfectly well if you introduce the concept of a residual. So what is a residual for this type of equation? It's a misfit between the first derivative and n at u. So if you think that u is your solution to the neural field equation, since uh, it satisfies this equation for all time, your residual will be zero at every time t. So how do you cook up an approximation? One way to say that is to select a family of approximating subspace, x subspaces, x sub n. In practice, what you do is you select a basis, and then xn is the span of it. You then construct a candidate approximation of this type, and this is now resembling of the Galerkin method, but as I will show you, the same applies for the collocation methods as well. And then you require, in a way that I have to make precise later, that the residual be small at un instead of u. So if, if instead of putting un, you get u here, it, was, it should be zero. And uh, in now you evaluate at un, so at this truncation, and you make the residual small at all times in a way that I'm going to tell you in one slide. It turns out that if you want to accomplish any of these tasks, and in fact you want to get any novelty and use any form of information about neural fields, you just need to look at objects that are called projection operators. So let's go back to our collocation scheme now, the one that we started at the beginning. What would you do? Your typical set up will say that you are in space of continuous function, so you are in CD, and you have to pick a basis and approximating subspaces. So the good thing to do in this case is to revise your uh, numerical methods 101 book, and they will tell you how to do Lagrange interpolation. So this is a basis of function, is a, is a set of functions that are one, well, that Li is one at Xi and is zero at all the other interpolation nodes. And as you do that, you can now decompose an element of the function, well, uh, an element of the function space Xn in this way. Now, I know that notation will grow up, but that, and, and after, especially after what we discussed this morning, I, have, I feel compelled to give you pointers, okay? In case you get, uh, we get lost. And now there's something that I need to pass across very quickly. You see me that I've used here V as a letter that is different from U. And this is going to be important for the remainder. In here, I'm trying to describe how an approximation happens in X. This has nothing to do with the neural field, okay? And that's when I'm going to use the letter V. Later on, this is not going to be the case. So in here, I'm using a standard, and I'm approximating V of X with V sub N. And what I've defined under the hood is a projection operator that takes an element V and it returns an element in Xn uh, in this way. And these objects are fairly well studied, so I'm now talking about the collocation projector. And one important piece of information is that there exists a characterization of this type. So Pn of V is known to be zero if you pick that interpolation projector, if and only if V at Xi is zero. Have I heard? No? For all i. So, um, how do, you do, how do you do that? Well, you carry out your uh, uh, decomposition. This time you do it on U. And this is the bit where I'm going to tell you how you make your residual small. Remember, I have to tell you how to do that. And this is where I explain you how to do it. Well, not I, but rather Atkinson in the, st in the steady state case. It will say, instead of demanding that, I mean, you know that R of UN cannot be zero, but you demand that its projection be zero at all X and all T. And since you have this characterization, demanding this at all x, r, x, and t is the same as demanding that the residual at any of the, at all the interpolation node x, i, be zero. And this condition is particularly important. How do you use that? Well, the second 
formulation that you have. It's the one that tells you how you implement the method. So this is the one that will make it look like an ODE, so to speak. But if you stick with the top one, you're going to get an evolution on the Banach space X sub N. This is an evolution on Rn. This is an evolution equation on Xn. And this is going to be the one that is important for us. It looks simple, so to speak, because it says project the right side of the neural field. There's nothing more to it. Now, I can go faster on the Galerkin projector, because I think you might have seen this before. In this case, instead of having an interpolation projector, you take an orthogonal projector. So you start from a Hilbert space. Oops, that's why L2 is important, and that's why I'm selecting that L2. You pick a, a basis uh, for X uh, for the ambient space, and you truncate, as always. And this time, you have an orthogonal projector. So this time, your coefficient will be the in products between V and phi sub J. And also, the orthogonal projectors are very well known and characterized. And it is known that PVN, PNV is zero, if and only if all the inner products with V and phi I are zero. And this is what gets you now to the uh, Galerkin scheme. You have an identical condition on the projected residual, but since the projector that you're now looking at is an, orth is an orthogonal projector, instead of having the set of ODEs, you see before, you have what is called a, a variation formulation, let's say. And this is more or less the same game as before. The bottom equation looks horrible, and it will be horrible for the remainder of my talk, but it also will be unimportant. The one that we want to look at is the one on the top, which is identical to this, the one that you've seen before. There is no difference between these two projectors. So I think I have more or less successfully made the link between what these two different schemes are. They effectively are two manifestations of these type of equations in which PN is either a projection, uh, projection or an interpolatory scheme. But now I, I have two set of ODEs, one in X and one in XN, and I can compare solutions to these schemes. So in fact, it is not hard to, to prove just following the footsteps of Olivier's work that if uh, your function, you know, if you, if you start with this dynamical system, on Xn, you will remain in Xn, and you actually, this is something I should have said before, both the neural field solution and the projected neural field solution are solutions that are quite regular. They're a class of C, C1, you know, they're, they're mapping of C1 regularity from J to X. J is the time interval. And so now what you will be doing is you have a, a true solution, you have an approximated solution that lives in Xn, but also, of course, lives in X. And so you can take Take, uh, you select a given time and you say how far are they apart. But your solution, remember, also lives in Cjx. And so you can also look at the soup, uh, the worst case scenario over all your times. And in fact, you can also look at the C1 norm if this is something that is interesting to you, but I will not be doing it here. The only bit of information that I want to introduce here is that there is a big mouthful of a notation here. There it is. And that's meant to be the sub norm across all times, okay? To distinguish between this one, which is instead the norm on X. So here's where I have my theorem, except that it's too large to fit in the slide, and it's already awful once you'll see it. So I think I'll, uh, I'll keep it small. So um, under generic assumptions on W, F, and Xi, and by this, I really mean the same assumptions that you will typically need to prove existence and uniqueness of a neural field in the respective function spaces, X, L, L, T, L2, or uh, X in CD. So under those assumptions, two things can be concluded immediately. The first one is that if you want to know whether your scheme converges or not, you can completely disregard neural fields, and you can just concentrate on the projector. So it turns out that if you look at the convergence rate of your, uh, the convergence of your projector. Remember my V means I'm looking at how the projector approaching well in the ambient space. So if you have that, you have convergence in X, so to speak, for the projector, this implies convergence in the C norm for the solution to the neural field equation, for all solutions that you have, for all solutions of the neural field equation. And that's uh, already quite handful. But as a numerical analyst, you cannot stop here because what you really are interested in how fast you go, so, you know, what's the convergence rate. And it turns out that if your projector converges for every V in X, this is the same condition that you need here, not only do you have convergence of the scheme, but also the rate 
at which u converge is the same rate at which this sequence converges. And this sequence has nothing to do with your approximate solution. So there is no un here. What this is to say is just look at your true solution and look at how the projector behaves with respect to your true solution. This quantity you can estimate. I'll show you how just by looking at again at the projector itself. You don't need anything else. Now, if you are in the possible, not unlikely circumstance that some v, for some v you have divergence, you can't use these two statements, but there are some handy, some handy uh, error estimates for you, and they are expressed in terms of alpha n and beta n, which are coefficients that, lo and behold, also depend on the production scheme. Okay, so these are things that if, you're, if, if your projector is a little bit weird, uh, so to speak, you can still recover it. You can still recover existence and rates just by looking at this quantity here. Okay, so uh, where are we? We have looked at two different uh, type of schemes, and by now I'm confident that you, you know, if I've lost you, I think I want to recuperate for you now. There exist two schemes, the collocation and the projection scheme, the Galerkin scheme, and they're both just projector schemes, and we know that they converge. Um, provided, uh, pardon, provided um, the projector is good enough, so to speak. And now you can follow the standard numerical analysis template. You have typically two ways to do that, to continue. You either partition your domain D into smaller elements, the finite element scheme, and when you do that, you typically pick a basis, the phi j, that are locally defined, they are near by each triangle, they're, 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 that's their support, let's say, roughly speaking. Or you can go the spectral way, and if you go the spectral way, your functions are globally defined and your support is everywhere. And of course, you can mix and match. Uh, this is not a secret. But what is perhaps interesting here is that as far as I know, we only use this at the moment. We don't move these type of schemes. That's what I, I think too. Okay, so this is, is very dense. Uh, so let me just try uh, to give you an, a concrete example of how you do things. So suppose you, you're given a neural field or a similar network, how, what, how you should approach that. You first thing you do is you put your neural field on a side, you just check that the solution exists and it's well behaved first. Then instead you look at in which function space you are. And in here I'm making the case that D is just a line for the sake of simplicity, but everything that I say works in, in higher dimensions as well. And let's say you go the finite elements way. So now you partition your interval into these finite elements, d1, d2, d3, and I've picked up the simplest, you know, the textbook 10 functions that you can find in every uh, finite element uh, introductory book. This basis, this, well, this set is actually known to interpolate uh, functions in continuous at the grid points, okay? So you can construct xn this way, and implicitly you're defining your projector. Now, you want to know whether your neural field works, what, uh, scheme works, what you do is you stick with the projector and you ask yourself, how does the projector approximate a function V in CD? And since in here, in, I mean, I'm in an easy setup, you, you go to the next page of the book and they'll tell you, oh, for any function V in C2, that projection is, you know, the, the error of that projection is bound by, say, the modulus of continuity, continuity of the function. Or if a function is, is sufficiently regular, you have this hx to the power 2 appearing, where hx is now the, the spacing of your grid, which is also another 1 upon n. So from here, you conclude two things, well, three. First off, you can be sure that your projector is well behaved for all v. Then you use the convergence theorem I discussed above. So you immediately know that your neural field scheme will converge. Not only do you know that, but now you're interested in how fast it will converge, and for that you need to estimate this quantity here. <clears throat> and if you require sufficient regularity, you effect well, you effectively can always use these type of estimates here to do that. But in particular, in the case that, that I'm now considering, I want to assume sufficient regularity of the solution is C2 in this case, and therefore I have a term order hx to the power 2. That happens, okay? And so I, I can conclude immediately that my scheme is order n to the minus 2 convergent. And so for, for those that hate functional analysis, you think now is the time that is going to show us some simulation, and I'm almost there. It's, it's not quite there, okay? Because what do you do now? You want to put this on a computer. 
And so you would go back and say, well, I now have the set of all these. You know, remember that I have two, type, two visions of these keys. One of them in PN, and then there was a, the ODE equivalent formulation. But if you look at what you just written down, you don't have, I've kind of cheated a little bit, you don't have a set of ODEs. You have things that look like that. And okay, you may, in this may be a lot to process, but certainly there is still an integral there. So this is the moment where you should choose quadrature. So, so far, since, I mean, the last time I've used quadrature was the, the very in slide two of my talk. I, I never made any commitment to the quadrature. And that's what, what I expect. I've been looking at error in function spaces. So this is the time when I pick a quadrature rule. What we typically do at the moment, I mean, I, am, I do this myself when I say we so say I, what I do at the moment, is I typically pick a quadrature that I think it's sufficiently accurate and it grants me some convergence. And what I can do now after having this result is know what to pick. Why do I do that? Because in picking this integral, I'm going to have to pick the simplest quadrature rule that preserves order n to the minus 2 convergence. Because if I now, if I now introduce a less accurate scheme, I'm going to pollute the convergence of the projector that is above it. Conversely, if I take too sophisticated a scheme, that will be wasted. I don't need any, I, you know, it's going to be the projector that dictates my, my convergence. So I'm now going to show you some results, and you should believe me that I can do the same for finite elements Galerkin and also for spectral collocation schemes. So what do you do here? You, I've, I've now picked up a neural field that has a ridiculous kernel. And this kernel is ridiculous because it, it has absolutely no biological application. I, I wouldn't even know how to classify this kernel. But it's such that it grants me an analytical solution in closed form. And by varying this function zeta, I can select different type of uh, regularity for w that I need for my nice estimates, let's say. And what I do here is I now run six different choices of, of zeta, which I don't want to discuss with you now. And I look at how my scheme converges. So in here, you're seeing the finite element collocation scheme. That's the one for which I told you it's an order n to the minus 2. And what do I do? I pair it with the trapezium scheme as a quadrature, because I know that trapezium is order two. And lo and behold, the scheme behaves like I want, so to speak. It's an order two error. This is now the C error that I've discussed earlier on. And then um, I move to the spectral collocation scheme. And for the spectral collocation scheme, I have not told you, and you would have to believe me that, that I expect convergence much faster than order n to the minus two with the kernel that I picked. That's a well-known thing if you if you're into spectral methods type things. But in here, you're not seeing any gain with respect to this other scheme. And why is that? Because I've coupled a very performance scheme with uh, with higher order accuracy. In fact, order I can prove that for some cases this is higher than n to the minus k for large k. Uh, I've paired it with the trapezium scheme, which is an order two scheme. And so what I'm seeing there is the order two error. But if I pick the correct quadrature scheme, and in this case I pick Crenshaw Curtis because that's the one that guarantees the spectral accuracy. On the same six problems that I, that I find here, I observe accuracy that it's much, much faster. In addition, this scheme uses FFTs. And uh, I think I, I've, I've never seen this before, and I wish I had known it before because I've been using all the time this type of scheme, and I will never do that again. In particular, I thought you could use FFTs only on periodic domain, but this doesn't have to be the case. This isn't the case. And it turns out that the same applies for finite element Galerkin. So a common error that I've done in the past is I've used Gauss quadrature because I think that Gauss quadrature is more accurate. But in here, I've used it on a scheme that is on order two. So there's really no gain on that. I could have just as well used trapezium here. And of course, I have a spec. Galerkin uh, scheme with its own convergence rate that it's super fast and I'm very very happy about that. So let me conclude. First off, I think I've discussed now a set of schemes that provide, uh, I hope, a numerical foundation for studying uh, models of this type, and they and they are applicable to models that are not just neural fields. In fact, I would go so far as to say, if you have, for instance, hybrid models in which you're trying to couple a neural field type model with a discrete model for, say, the thalamus or something like that, 
this would still work. I think at the moment, it would just not quite work if I add diffusion somewhere along the cortex, but this is kind of work in progress. The second is that I think we now have a systematic way to pair quadrature and, um, and discretization in a way that it's, uh, in my opinion, quite exciting. So let me just conclude by saying that, I mean, it, it would be foolish of me not to drop the stochastic of random words in this audience. I think this would be, it would really be bad. And in fact, I would say that the real motivation why this type of analysis has been done is because we want to move to cases where your neurobiological network has random data or even a stochastic forcing. And for, and for these, you need foundations. And what you've seen today is really the, 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 the basis on which we're going to build. When I say we, I'm really referring to this uh, new research group that we have jointly with uh, Radboud University. Um, so Gabriel Lord uh, and I have been discussing these things for about uh, five years now across countries and different failed grants. But now it seems we have resources to do that. And uh, we are very uh, enthusiastic to have Francesca Cavallini and Hadija, Hadija Medini that are going to start soon working on uncertainty quantification and data assimilation for these type of networks. Let me just say that we, have, we are active on Zulip, so we use this channel not just to discuss our research, but discuss more broadly with people in the Netherlands and hopefully with anyone who is interested in joining things that rotate about numerical analysis for the neurosciences. So if you're, if you're interested in joining us, please uh, drop us uh, an email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniele. Any questions or comments? Thank you for this talk. Um, my curiosity, what kind of hypothesis you need on the W? Okay. So let's say that if you are in, uh, in the spaces of continuous function, you know, you, that's your setup. What you would typically take for W is to be a continuous function on, Ome on D cross D, because you have two, um, so two, uh, two slots, right? W is a function of X, it's bivariate. So you typically take C of D, D. But this hypothesis can be a little bit uh, kind of made relaxed. Your F needs to be the one, the one for doing this type of work, you want F to be bounded. And in my case, for proving, for making my life easier, I've also assumed that F is differentiable with bounded uh, derivative, let's say. Xi has to map from T to your ambient space. If you are in L2, you have a different set of hypotheses. Typically, you would take W to be in L2, D cross D. Same things for F, and your Xi adapts appropriately. I would say that uh, the real, you know, Olivier might typically be a good person. I mean, I'm going to get into troubles when I want to stay away from these schemes, uh, from these setups. Probably Olivier will tell me which kernels I should select. But for, for the time being, these work, let's say. Thank you for <clears throat> thank you for this uh, very nice uh, presentation, uh, Daniel. Um, I have a quick question about uh, the domain where you solve your 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 neural field equation. Yes, your brain the brain is in fact uh, if you think about the cortex, it's thick and it has a complicated shape. Yes, uh, but also uh, when you do uh, perception, the color, uh, visual perception, mm -hmm. you have to add to the spatial variable. The feature variable, which yes. is the projective line, uh, point carré disk, uh, which are complicated uh, manifolds. Yes, but I think for this to work, you, so for, for these is, schemes uh, to go across, you need uh, a projector that is able to map from functions to those domains to the corresponding, uh, let's say, finite dimensional subspaces. But uh, if, say, you, you pick up a tensor product structure, you're fine, which I don't think it's a good idea to do in the case of vision. But uh, yeah, so it's not restricted to by that. What you're going to get problems is not so much the domain, but what type of projector you're going to select for that. Um, having, yes. So I don't want to comment more, but I, th I think we do have work that is going in that direction as well. Oh, you do? Okay. Yes. Cool. Discuss this. Those are questions? Yes. Uh Thanks a lot, Daniele, for this interesting talk. I have a question which is a bit similar to Olivia's, in fact, 
Apart from domain, uh, do you also uh, have any kind of, uh, or I don't know, uh, would it create some problems to choose some particular type of in neural field equ equations, uh, some particular types of uh, transfer functions, for example? Would it affect your uh, approximation methods? For example, transfer functions? which are not only dependent on uh, voltage contribution of neurons, but also, I don't know, uh, some uh, solder varying uh, adaptivity variables, which you can, I don't know, interpret not only as uh, adaptivity variables, but also, for example, uh, like Would eye compressions or this kind of things. Would that be fine for you? If T is a, a generic... T is time. Time, yeah. But if you want, I can put here V of T, and then you have an OD. Then I would say, yes, this is yes, my... Yes, that's fine. Yeah, U so, and V, uh, for example. That's, there's no problem, provided okay. that f is bounded and it's differentiable in the right way. Yeah, this, is, yes. this was exactly my question. Okay, thanks. But I think we'll discuss this uh, this afternoon, right? <laughs> there was a question here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Daniel. It was very interesting. Um, I was going to ask a question about the domain, but I will put it in a, another way. So as far as I know that uh, functional analysis provides a nice theory if the domain is smooth enough and regular in the borders, etc. Yes. So um, have you considered, for instance, to consider the domain uh, as the cortex and it is composed uh, as finite, finite um, partition of, let's say, visual cortex, prefrontal cortex, and those subdomains are not uh, necessarily uh, regular in the borders. So what do you think if we make approximation in each domain di, let's say, and we couple uh, do the approximation at every subdomain, uh, do you think that we will have a smooth approximation of the general um, uh, solution if it exists or not? Because, uh, yeah, so, so I'm trying to sketch here something, right? All right, yeah. So let's say that is my domain D at the moment, and you are discussing a domain D that is not smooth. So, if it's fine for you that it's kind of you know attached with triangulation surfaces, uh, 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 not only that is what we can do, but that is where we definitely go once we introduce finite elements. So, these are actually approximations. The coupling itself does not constitute any problem, provided the functions in each domain are well-defined. If I then replicate the situation in an area that is underneath, let's say, and I can still triangulate that, this is not a problem. So, the, so problem the only problem that I'm aware of is that if you're looking, if you're trying to pose your equation in Sobolev spaces, uh, let's say you want to go to H2 of D, then your domain D has to satisfy cone properties as we, you would do for PDEs. That's, I think, that's what I think it's... Uh, Okay. It's gonna work. So, so but provided those, you are within here, it's going I think it's gonna work. Okay. So those triangles should be um they should have the same size everywhere or it can have different sizes. Uh, the, the variables the, or no or? the triangles, the, the approximation, so the when you're when you're looking at a triangulation, the way to send the triangulation to zero is to look at its diameter. And so you typically you will rise your entire surface, you know, your entire triangulation. And if it's disconnected, also the disconnected part, you're taking the largest diameter that you have, and it's that that you're sending to zero in a finite element method. And this is exactly what I'm hoping Francesca and Hadija yeah. will, uh, will, uh, will do for us. Good luck. Thank, yeah, you. thank, thank you. Thank you again. Yes. Um, was there questions? Yeah. 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 I have a very concrete question. If you Choose the quality of the approximation you need. How much time do you gain by uh, implementing uh, this strategy? A lot. Like, uh, so, so a, a lot. Uh, yeah. I mean, the projection scheme itself—it's uh, not—it's not really so much of a, of a speed up. What you gain in speed up is if you understand which quadrature goes well with your scheme. And but, but there is something I forgot to say. And now this is the perfect moment to say it. If you want to have an idea for this. And if you go on my website, I've prepared a code capsule. So what this means is that even if you don't have a MATLAB license, with a single button press, you can reproduce all the results in the paper on your laptop in real time without even having to download the stuff. And you can then play with it. So you can really have a, a concrete idea of how you do it. But the, 
the, the gains are all in the interplay between quarter and projectors. And this is something that so far has not been highlighted and I've exploited in, in one of or two, or two of the figures that you've seen today. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there are two questions on the internet. Gregory, do you want to speak? To yes, any... sure. I hope you hear me well. Uh, my question is very naive for Daniele. It's, uh, so what you presented uh, is what I would call a semi-discrete analysis in the sense that uh, at the level of your presentation, uh, the, 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 you still uh, preserve continuous time, but uh, when you really implement it on your laptop at the end, you also need to discretize it in, well, uh, in well, time. Well, yes. And so you need a second, somehow a second step in your analysis and you yes. also and, and in fact, this, yes. uh, find schemes that would be <laughs> okay. good enough in time and not just uh, say, Explicit order. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you asked this question, Greg, because I think you're just letting me speak for longer than I should have effectively. So, um, as you see here, for instance, I don't know if you can see my slides. Let's say there is a plateau at some point, right? At 10 to the minus. Oops, where are we? At 10 to the minus five. Okay, and this happens also in the other scheme. So, what one can prove is the following: the moment you introduce a time discretization. You can still do that at the level of the, so without discretizing space. So what I'm saying is that in, in the paper that I've just submitted, there is an example for which, for instance, in which you say, okay, I look at the ODE in, in, in continuous time, and then I have a way to generate sequences in Banach species that are at discrete time sets. And what is proved there is that the error as you would expe expect, splits naturally. You have a time component of the error and then uh, the projector error that they separate well. So what you're seeing here, for instance, is exactly that effect. You can see here that at some point, uh, the, 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 the time step that I picked, in this case, Rungekuta, fifth order, you know, is accurate up to 10 to the minus five. That's because my relative tolerance has been set to that. Now, if your question, and I'll try to be brief, is your question is about how do I select that? And if I have to worry about stability and conditioning and all of these sort of things, I believe that's something worth noting. However, a neural field is typically forgiving uh, these non-local schemes because they have spectrum that is well, uh, is well uh, behaved, so to speak. Do I address your question, Greg? Yes, sure. Thank you. Okay, Romain? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have maybe a naive question. Um, um, so you choose, uh, um, so I guess my question is related to the non-delayed case, but you choose to um, uh, basically discretize the domain of the, of the operator of W. Uh, I've thought about discretizing the, 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 the range of W, which could be a, a smaller. So for example, if you have like a 2D range for W, it will end up with a very, uh, small uh, OD in the end if you project to the range. Well, that's it. That's my question. Uh, except I don't understand it. Can you just uh, explain again? So, for example, if W is 2D, the range. Yeah, so if, if your kernel to start with is just a uh, low dimensional, then one would argue that you don't have an infinite dimensional dynamical system to start with, and that gives you direction along which you should project, yes. So what I'm trying to say, and that's actually perhaps a good observation that you've made, is that it's not always the case. I mean, in choosing the basis phi i, or it's not that you always have to look at your spatial domain. Sometimes you have different type of uh, projections along which you can uh, you can project. So, for instance, in here, when uh, we are looking at, uh, uh, let's say, what we call surrogate model, we'll just exploit that the fact that your kernel as a, can be approximated well by a finite dimensional uh, approximation, and we're going to extract the, a good basis for that. So that's correct. You don't always have to pick a, a spatially dependent uh, basis. Sometimes the basis may be dictated by properties of the, of the kernel, for instance. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, other questions or comments? So let's thank the speaker again. Are you also speaking?